Hi everybody, so uh, here with me today is Tabitha Ferrar and uh, she is an eating disorder recovery coach and she shares her experience, uh, research and wisdom through her blog, her podcast, YouTube videos and her book and I'm very excited to do this interview with her today. So Tabitha, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, thank you. (laughs) So uh, I want to ask you maybe first uh, to share your story, like what kind of eating disorder past you come from and uh, where you are today? Yeah, so I um, had anorexia for give or take sort of 12 years. It's kind of because the edges are always fuzzy. It's not like you start one day and you finish another day. Um, But my onset of anorexia was kind of just before my 18th birthday I think that summer um before my my birthday and so I was I was 17 so relatively late compared to a lot of people that their onsets around um you know 13 14 15 maybe on earlier in puberty stages but so I my onset was quite late it wasn't to do with any body image issues at all in fact I kind of was really quite happy with my body as a teenager which is Mm -hmm. strange to say (laughs) there's not many teenagers that can say that Um, And I was a tomboy and I wasn't really, I was into horses and, you know, wasn't really thinking about any of that sort of stuff, really. But um, I needed to lose a little bit of weight in order to ride a particularly small racehorse at the the training yard that I worked at. So that's actually what started it all. And um, I only ever needed or wanted to lose five pounds. Um, But that was enough for me to go into um, energy deficits for long enough for anorexia to be triggered, which led to... 10, 12 years of really struggling mm-hmm. with anorexia. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think it's very important to acknowledge that it doesn't only start with a diet or it's not about the vanity, but it's actually like how the brain can respond to starvation, right? Exactly. You know, and we have the genetic information now on anorexia, and so we know that, that there's a genetic element to it. I obviously have that genetic element in me and then going into energy deficit was enough to spark off that that genetic response to what my body perceived was there's not enough food in the environment yeah so maybe you can uh, talk more about that because this is what I have found like through my own work because I never had anorexia myself so I'm just trying to understand it more like uh like, so how, why a person has this such an emor- enormous fear of food and weight gain? Like maybe from the well, evolutionary you know, perspective. Yeah. And, and you know, if you've, if you've read my blog, you'll, you'll know that I do, I talk about that a lot. Um, yes. And there was a, a lady called Shan Geisinger and she, a um, long time ago now, wrote this um, paper called The Adaptively Famine Perspective of Anorexia. And I actually found that because... I was researching things like um, migration in animals because I had a very strong um, exercise compulsion with my anorexia. In fact, that was, for me personally, even harder than eating more food was stopping exercise. I I was doing incredibly excessive amounts of exercise every day. And if it wasn't even just exercise, I was moving all day. I wouldn't have been able to sit in this chair when I had anorexia, I couldn't sit during the day. I had to stand and move the whole time. So it fascinated me. Why is this happening? And because we're, we're told a lot about not eating when people have anorexia, but especially well, 15 years ago when I was sort of struggling with it, there was no talk about exercise. I couldn't mm-hmm. even find any, really any research on it. Um, and so I was looking into like, why did this happen? And I was very interested because as I felt in my own recovery, when, I, when my weight came up, I noticed that my fear of weight gain decreased, my fear of eating decreased, and my exercise compulsions decreased, which really interested me. And because my recovery was all over the place, my weight went up a bit, and then I kind of slid, and my weight went down a bit. And when my weight went down again, I felt that my exercise compulsions were increasing, and my fear of weight gain was increasing, mm-hmm. and my fear of eating more was increasing. So all of this was really fascinating to me. And I started to research into exercise, why, like why, why animals, when animals are starved of food, there are certain animals that start to exercise more as well. Mm. And that, then I found the, um, what Shan had written about the adaptive flea famine perspective, and that is that this genetic response that some people, only some of us with those genetics, have to 
a reduction in food intake is actually that your body assumes that you're in a famine environment because there's not enough food coming in. And if you're in a famine environment, it wants to migrate. So it wants to move to where there's more food. And so for those of us that have really strong sort of OCD compulsive movements and exercise, that could be the migration bit coming in. And you can see this in rats in the laboratory. If rats are starved of enough food for long enough, they'll start running in their wheel and refusing to eat. They're trying to migrate. They're trying to move. Their bodies are just telling them, move, 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 which is what it felt like my body was telling me. Um, and so after having found that, I contacted Shan, and, and we've done quite a bit of work and podcasts together, and she's also... Um, heavily featured in, in the book that I'm writing at the moment, which is sort of um, more of my experience of anorexia and a lot more of these, how my experiences then sort of correlate with things like the adaptive leaf famine perspective and other research as well. Um, it's a really fascinating illness, actually. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it when you're in it. It feels scary and terrible. But from if you, if you can just look at it, it's, it's a fascinating illness. It's fascinating how somebody's body can become terrified of eating food it's fascinating how somebody who is underweight and exhausted can find the energy like I did to run every day it's incredible that the human body can do that and so to my mind the only reason that the body would do that is to think for some reason that it needs to do that in order to survive and migrating animals have to move in order to survive and as Sean explained to me you know, because you might think, well, where does the not eating bit come in? Like, why are we scared of food? And as Sean explained to me, when uh, your brain thinks that there's a famine and there's no food in the environment, it doesn't want you to stop and be looking for food because there's no food. You'll die if you spend a long time doing that. It wants you to not want to eat and just move, mm -hmm. move to where the food is. And so your brain is kind of seeing Eating is a threat to migration. If you stop and eat too much, that's a threat to your ability to move. And anything that's a threat to migration will end up with you dead. So hence, we start to develop this fear of food. Because it's too strong a fear. It's a crippling fear. It's too strong for it to just be like, oh, you know, I want to always be a size 10 or whatever. It's too strong for that. For somebody like me who used to ride event horses and compete and as not scared of much, the fact that I had this cripplingly strong fear of eating more food and weight gain, it does, I do not buy that that's just body image issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't buy that. It has to be something more survival-based and stronger for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think this is very, very helpful. And, uh, and for me, like overcoming my bulimia and orthorexia, kind of the science part or just like the logic of it, you know, like the restriction and the Minnesota starvation experiment, like this helped me to have the, like the courage to overcome it and to recover. It's and, helpful, isn't um, it? Yeah, yeah. So, but one thing I was thinking if, like about the migration. Uh, so if the body or the brain doesn't want to, you know, like stay in place when there's maybe even a little bit food, then how does a person recover from the starvation? Like, when mm. is the point when a person is like, okay, now I have abundance of food? Uh, like, how did they recover from it in a past? Right. I, I asked Sean this very question because mm. I had that question as well. And um, I hadn't done, she, she's done so much research on animal migration and human migration because humans would have migrated once too. But now we have shops on the corners the whole time. So, of course, we don't need anything like that. But you, if you think about it, before, um, agriculture and, and farming and things like that um, famine would have been the biggest threat to human life like that would have been the thing that we really had to learn to survive so it's no coincidence that some of us have these genetics that bang click in when the body thinks it's going into famine and then if you imagine more well, humans would have lived in I guess tribes of people big family clans or whatever you want to call them and if there was a famine then everybody would need to migrate everybody would need to move and everybody would be undernourished everybody would be in malnutrition for that time and so then when you got to the place where there's all this abundant food then everybody would be stuffing their faces and feasting mm -hmm. everybody would be eating and I think that for many of us with anorexia one of the really hard parts about eating the amount of food that we need to eat in order to recover which for me was thousands and thousands of calories every day is that it's more nobody else is doing it like no one else around me was just stuffing their face all day like I yeah. felt that I needed to. And so if you imagine if you're in this situation where 
everybody migrates and you find the herd of buffalo and people kill buffalo and there's this big feasting and everybody's eating tons of food because everybody's in malnutrition and everybody is starving hungry. It would have been really a lot easier to just eat more because most of us find that when other people are eating more, we feel that we have permission to eat more as well. Mm-hmm. So I think it would it, you would be in an environment that would make it really easy just to feast, just to mm-hmm. eat, because feast follows famine. That's that's the natural cycle. Periods of famine are followed by feast eating. Yeah, this is what I hear from uh, like the people I help or just through my comments and stuff is that like this is too much. Nobody eats this much. Like this is crazy. I know. But I'm like you can't compare yourself to a normal. Like no, person. you have to eat abnormally large amounts of food. And mm-hmm. that's why I've been told it's helpful when I tell people, yeah, I ate, like some days I ate over 10,000 calories. Mm-hmm. I know I did. That actually, that knowledge helps people know that, oh, it's okay for me to do that because I'm in recovery. So if you think that if everybody around you was eating that amount of food, you'd mm-hmm. recover probably pretty easily and pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for sharing all that. And uh, so... How did you start your recovery when you had this enormous fear of the weight gain and food? Well, it had been, um, it it was, I'd love to say that it was rainbows and light. And one day I just woke up and thought, life's going to be wonderful. It really wasn't like that. I was, um, I I was in a pretty bad place. I was in a very dark place. Um, The last couple of years, um, that I that I've been the sort of later years in with anorexia, I had really been in a dark place. I was exhausted. I was so tired and mentally and physically exhausted. And malnutrition has so many effects on on your body. And so I, my body was incredibly depleted. My mind was becoming incredibly depleted. I was terribly lonely um, because I pushed away all my social life for so long. I didn't really have any friends. Um, and so that it was really I I was. Um, I hate to say I was suicidal. I was in a very dark place. Um, And it really was, for me, a matter of, well, if I kind of want to kill myself anyway, I may as well just eat and see what happens. Um, And I did. Um, And it wasn't, it was messy and it was up and down and it's not like I made that decision and then it was easy. Of course it wasn't. It was really difficult. But I think that the other side of it is that I think a lot of recovery is is more about just giving up, um, giving up resisting the food because we're really hungry. I was so hungry. And it was more a case of I just gave up and allowed the food to come and I just allowed myself to eat. So it was more of a surrender than an active I'm fighting for recovery. Yeah. I just I just gave up um, and ate <laughs> mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, so people always want to ask me, like, how long time the recovery takes? And uh, so how yeah. long did your recovery take? Oh, like, well, before I got to that place that I just told you about, where I just gave up and mm-hmm. ate, I was in recovery mm-hmm. for about four four years. And when I was in recovery, I was actually in a binge restrict exercise cycle for about four years. And that was... The only reason I say I was in recovery was because the first six years or so that I had anorexia, I didn't even know I had anorexia. I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't the stereotypical body image stuff. Um, I didn't want to be thin. I didn't like being thin. Um, and so, and I wouldn't go to a, any therapists or anything like that. So I, I was sort of in denial that I had anorexia, The like, but then, then, after six years, it was like kind of like, yeah, I, I do have this. And at least I was in that place and I was trying to gain weight and trying to recover. But I was just in a binge restrict exercise cycle. So I was eating huge amounts of calories at night, only ever at night. And then I'd restrict all day and exercise all day. So I was really caught in this cycle for a long time. And then I got to the point that I just told you about where I was just, I'm done. I'm so done with this. And then it, I have to admit it pretty fast because I really ate. I ate a lot of food in that time. And so it took um, months, not years, for me to get fully nutritionally rehabilitated. Um, but that's nutritional rehabilitation is not the end point by any means. In fact, I think that that's often the easy part to go from you know, to, you kind of have this this period where you just are eating a load of food and you start to gain weight. And then the hard part really is is keeping that weight on and staying there. And so it's usually the 
six to 12 months, I think, after you've sort of hit a healthy weight range, that's really hard because mentally you're still in anorexia. Your brain hasn't caught up. You need to rewire all the neural pathways of anorexia, and that takes a long time. But physically, you're in a larger body, and your brain's freaking out about that as well. So you've got this six to 12-month period really before your brain starts to click in and, and get used to this new body, and um, everything begins to come easier. And I think that's the really hardest part. But then even then, I think that the couple of years that followed that, I was still noticing changes in my attitude, just subtle things, noticing things like um, somebody had asked me out for lunch and I'd said yes before I'd even thought about it. It, it wasn't like I was making myself say yes or I was saying yes and then silently freaking out. It was just like water off a duck's back, just little changes like that took years, I think. And I would notice them and be like, wow, that was actually me. I didn't have any anxiety about that decision. Things like that or, or noticing oh, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Mm -hmm. So that's my brain coming away from that being hyper aware around food. And that stuff took a long while, but it was also fascinating and wonderful to watch my brain go through that process. Mm -hmm. so, um, so gaining weight and eating enough is kind of the key. Uh, it, and it's, it's kind of like your approach to recovery, like food first. Well, yeah, and I'm just, I'm just finishing, I'm writing a book about like, because I don't think there should be any one approach to recovery. Mm -hmm. I think that's bullshit because we're all individual. We're all different. There's no, there's nobody that's going to have the exact same recovery as me. So just because something worked for me doesn't mean that everybody else has to do that. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. We're all individuals. And I think the wonderful thing about people with anorexia is that they are so intelligent, mm -hmm. so smart. And so I think that most people with anorexia, they know that they're hungry they know that they want to eat. It's giving them permission to do so that is usually my role. But then also, say if you've had anorexia for three, five, 10, 15, 20 years, you have so much information about your own illness. You know the most, you know more than any doctor, you know more than anybody else. And I think recovery is a process of putting together all of that information and saying, I know that this happens when this happens and I know that I need help and support to do X, Y, and Z and in these stages. So I like to think of it more as like a, a project what the per and the person in recovery is right at the head of that project, leading the project. Mm -hmm. Because to get the full way there, we need, they need to be. It's their body, their brain. You know, they, nobody can tell you what you need in every one moment and tell you how to do things. Um, so, but overall, I, nutritional rehabilitation is a must. Because if your body's still in energy deficit, those genetics saying migrate or don't eat are still going to be active. So you can't recover, can you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have to get the body out of energy deficit. But then we also have to rewire the brain. And I spent a lot of time, actually, I've always been interested in yoga and meditation since I was early teens. But um, I now live in Boulder, Colorado, and I've lived here for, oh God, almost 10 years, I think. Um, and Boulder, Colorado, everybody's crazy about meditation here. It's a bit weird, but <laughs> it's like you can't go anywhere without tripping over somebody who's meditating on the sidewalk. I have actually seen that a few times. Um, but so I learned a lot of, of more meditation techniques. And actually, I, I taught um, yoga and meditation for trauma populations. And so um, women who have been through domestic violence, veterans. I, um, I used to run a nonprofit organization that taught meditation techniques to survivors of trauma and so in that uh, I took um, a couple of courses and yoga instructions on how to do that and in that I learned about how we change the neural pathways that the brain sets up because our brains are really formed made to form habits okay so when you have anorexia you've got all of these restrictive behaviors and exercise behaviors and all of these things and what happens over the years is you form this neural network in your brain where it's almost just like your automatic response to say someone saying do you want to come and have pizza is no because those neural networks that's what you've said for years and years and years so your brain starts to learn and form these neural networks with these responses and so while I began to understand that what I had been doing in my own recovery when I learned about how people rewire their brains after trauma or PTSD so that 
somebody who's an army veteran can not freak out if they hear a car backfiring down the road and think it's a gunshot. That's to do with rewiring that fear response mm -hmm. to that noise. So you need to rewire your brain to any given stimuli. And so I learned that that's actually what I had done in my nutritional rehabilitation stage. I had, rather than running away from all the foods that I was scared of, I run into them. I'm like, I'm going to eat that food. Rather than, and we have all these rules that are set up, like, oh, I can only eat lunch after 1 p.m., you know, and so I'd feel great anxiety if I was told to eat lunch at noon or earlier. And so running into and rewiring my, my brain there would be to say, I'm going to eat lunch at 11.30 just to show that I can, mm -hmm. to show my brain that doing that is not a threat. So that's the rewiring process. And that is why it's so important that the person who is in recovery is right at the front because nobody could say to me, you've got a problem with eating food earlier than 1 p.m., haven't you? Nobody would know that. Only I know that. And so only I can be the person to say, I've got to make myself eat lunch earlier every day to prove that I can and prove that I'm not scared of doing so. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So in order to overcome fear, you have to go into the fear. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Which sounds <laughs> horribly psychoanalytical, but it isn't, I promise. It's... Um, it's actually what it's what people have been doing with yoga and meditation techniques for thousands of years. It really is. It's it's that's basically what the sort of whole meditation stuff is. It is watching your thoughts, working out what you're scared of, and then making a decision to say, "Oh, it's kind of inappropriate that I'm scared of pizza and that my brain is scared of pizza." So therefore, I need to train my brain that pizza is not scary. And the way that I do that is by eating a shitload of pizza. Mm -hmm. And that's how I train my brain. It's just like how animals learn how anything learns. Like if you do something repetitively enough, the brain forms neural learning pathways. So that's what we need to unlearn the anorexia pathways and, re and start to reteach our brains that food isn't a threat and that it doesn't need to do all of these weird behaviors that we do and it doesn't need to exercise in order to eat and all of that stuff. Yeah, so this is very great because this is the information I also try to share with people. Excellent! So it's just kind of like reassuring me as well uh, because I have read a lot about it and stuff but just kind of to see more people like you and recovery coaches to uh, work on that because uh, I think it's a big problem that people in the, you know, like the recovery area and stuff, like therapists, they are afraid of the weight gain and food as much as the eating disorder is so i know so we just want to I confirm know. that and uh, and my and my approach is kind of also that there is no caloric limit there is not no such thing as gaining too fast eating too much because yes. this is kind of the biggest fear that the eating disorder person has right uh, so what is your view I'm, on all this well i work with my, I'd say that my stereotypical client is someone who is in their 30s or 40s and has been through eating disorder treatment for years and years and years. They've been through the resi residential, they've been through the inpatient, they've been through all of the stuff, they've been in therapy since for as long as they can remember, and they've still never got there. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's really because you can get somebody, um, you can feed someone and get them to the place where they are no longer in, in nutritional danger. But if you feed them only their safe foods on a safe structure and don't allow them to eat to that hunger that their body's really telling them is there, then the anorexia response, I think, may not turn off because our genetics are expecting a feast to follow the famine. That's what would have turned off, you know, the anorexia in, if it's a famine response. So there's that element. But also... Nobody, you know, like you could have a meal plan that says eat eggs on toast and a bowl of cereal and a yogurt and some biscuits for breakfast. You could have a meal plan that's got this really nice breakfast on it. Mm -hmm. But if you wake up in the morning and you think, you know what I really want is I want pop tarts and a donut. That's what I want for breakfast. Then if you're not responding to what you really want, then you're kind of restricting by sticking to the safe food. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, it's, totally. not all, it's not always about the caloric amount of the foods. I could have been eating 6,000 calories a day in recovery, but if I was only sticking to my safe foods at my safe times and it's all in my, you know, nicely anorexia controlled way, that's, that's not rewiring anything in my brain. That's not teaching me that I can just eat whatever the hell I want when I want it in the quantity that I want it. And so 
in a sense, when we recover on recover, because I don't really mm. think people do recover on these set, very standardized, very safe, um, controlled manners, um, then we're not really, it's just like anorexia, but with more food. That's yeah. kind of what it is. You're doing all the rules and all the stuff just with more food involved. It's not smashing all of the rules and changing the way that your brain perceives food and allowing that mental freedom to come through. Yeah. And uh, one other thing you talk about is uh, like responding to your mental hunger and not going by the like just physical hunger cues, right? Because this is like so messed up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it, there's, mil there's loads of reasons why for people with anorexia, physical hunger cues are kind of messed up um, from like endocrine system shutdown to um psychosomatic things I guess to the fact that your stomach isn't emptying as fast mm. so, and I think that the more, most logical reason why a person's hunger cues would be shut down is because if your brain thinks that you're in a famine it's not going to tell you like hunger signals are expensive they cost mm. the body calories to deliver a physical hunger signal so if your body's like I need to keep all of the calories that I can get and I need my metabolism as low as possible and there's no food anyway why would it waste Why would it waste calories sending you a hunger signal if it doesn't think that you're going to eat? So, but what is less expensive for the body or the brain is this mental hunger. And that is the obsessing about food. That is your brain telling you it needs food. That is what your body is trying to do. It can't give you physical hunger signals because that's too expensive, but it's desperate for you to eat. So that's your body trying to communicate with you. You need to eat a load of food. I know that. Because now that I'm nutritionally rehabilitated and have been for a long time, I don't think about food the whole time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sign of malnutrition that you're thinking about food the whole time. And if you think about it, none of this is actually, we don't need any of the science for this. This is common sense. If you're in a state of malnutrition and you're thinking about food the whole time, you probably need to eat the whole time. That's probably what your brain's trying to tell you, right? It's not rocket yeah. science. Yeah. And, uh, and you work with people who are not only underweight, yes? Because even people who are kind of like normal weight or whatever, and they're kind of like, but my body is not needing more weight gain and why I have this hunger, this is emotional eating, I'm addicted to sugar and stuff. So what is your response to that? Well, there's, the response is there's no such thing as a normal weight. And so we all have different size bodies and we all have that kind of like, genetically programmed weight range that everybody's body is going to have naturally. Of course, you can influence that by suppressing your body weight, which just about everybody in the population tends to do, which is kind of sad. But um, so if your body is naturally designed to be in a larger body frame, and that's where your body is happy and healthy, and nobody should judge that because that's what your body is programmed to do, then if you suppress your body weight, by restricting food or over-exercising, then your body is underweight for your body. And so it doesn't matter if your body is not underweight in terms of what some BMI scale says. What matters is that your body is underweight for your body. That's all that matters because your body doesn't care what everybody else's body is doing. Your body just knows I'm supposed to be this weight and I'm not this weight and I'm not getting enough food. That's all it knows. So it's really important to understand that you can be underweight at any size because it's relevant to your body only. And only your body matters in terms of your body's health and happiness. Um, so it's pretty simple that if you're suppressing your body weight via rest food restriction or exercise, and you're, then you are underweight for your body. Your yeah. body's not going to be happy about that. Yeah, and it's also about uh, you know restoring your you know bones and organs and everything. Like all the all the calories do not go only to the fat restoration. Like this is what the, the what the eating disorder thinks. Like oh, unnecessary weight gain. I don't need it. But also you don't you don't know what the body is doing. Like what is the purpose? I don't know what my body is doing right now. Like my body is probably <laughs> using calories. I don't know. It's yeah. probably repairing some muscle that. Um, I tripped over the cat yesterday, so it's probably like, I don't know what it's doing. My body's doing stuff. Yeah. And so because I, I'm not going to micro, I can't micromanage my body and mm. say, okay, body, just use like this many calories to mend that muscle and my big toe hurts. So you, you don't micromanage your body or I don't mm. say to my body, okay, body, take 10 breaths a minute or take 15 breaths the next minute 
like that's ridiculous so we don't micromanage our bodies our bodies just get on with what they need to do and we stay the heck out of it thank goodness um so, so it's in a sense you can't micromanage how your body uses calories either and you can't judge that mm. if one one person's bodies needs six thousand calories a day and the next person's bodies need eight thousand calories a day like who's to judge that it's just what that body needs so yeah and uh and also what i love about uh like the articles you write you write about the overshooting and aiming to overshoot so maybe you can talk a little bit about that post-starvation hyperphagia so and i always have a problem pronouncing that word and um, it, it's a so post-starvation after starvation and then phagia is is eating and then mm -hmm. hyperphagia is Lots of eating. So that's mm -hmm. what's com commonly known as overshoot. Um, I, I only found out about that kind of like I was doing a lot of research because one of my most popular sites, blogs on my site is one that I wrote about my, my recovery tummy. <laughs> yeah, I have read that. <laughs> Freaked me out. And I had, to do some I had to do some research and um, work that out, uh, what was going on with my stomach. And then that sort of also led me on to um, understanding more about um, – the research that's been done into this phenomenon of people wanting to eat a ton of food after a period of starvation, which if you think about it like that, is not a phenomenon at all. Mm -hmm. It's just complete common sense yeah. <laughs> that if you have not been eating enough food, you're going to want to eat a ton of food. So most of us feel this really bottomless pit hunger when we actually start eating more in recovery. Now, um, you might think, well, why don't you feel this crazy bottomless pit hunger the whole time? And like I said before, well, if your body thinks that there's a famine and there's not enough food around, it's not going to bother making you bottomless pit hungry. So for most of us, it's when we actually start eating more. Um, it doesn't happen to everyone either. Not everyone at all goes into this like um, feast mode, as I call it. But for most of us or some of us, when we start eating more, we go into feast mode because our bodies suddenly go, oh, yippee, we obviously got to where there's all this food. You need to eat. <laughs> it makes yeah. us want to eat the whole time. And it's a crazy time because there's a lot of um, nausea that often comes with that as well. So you feel famished, hungry, but then also sick. Um, it's just mm -hmm. a really crazy time, very scary because you just want to eat the whole time and you think you're going crazy. And, of course, your anorexia brain tells you that you're going to eat like this forever. Mm -hmm. um, you won't. It's just what your body needs to do in order to get out of um, that state of famine. And what I just I wrote I just wrote a bit about this um, in the book I'm writing. And I, what I wrote about was comparing it to like say if you were underwater and you held your breath, mm -hmm. and then when you come up for air, you're going to go, <gasps> mm -hmm. and you're going to gasp and gasp and gasp and gasp. And so in a sense, it's because your body has not had enough air. So when it gets there again, it wants to take in tons. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what our bodies are doing when they've not had enough food. And then when we start eating again, it wants to take in loads. So that, that um, extreme eating is really about like your body's just gasping for food and it just wants to inhale all the food for a while. And then once it balances out in the same way you don't gasp for breath forever mm -hmm. and you start breathing normally again, there will be a time when that goes away and you'll start eating normally again. Yeah, actually, this same comparison I have in my book <laughs> explaining the extreme hunger because this is exactly, uh, and also like when you're very sleepy, right? You're gonna be like, Oh, I need to sleep, let me sleep. You do everything to get to sleep. Uh, you won't wanna yeah. be worried about like, No, it's too much sleep or whatever. And right. uh, so, yeah, and also like drinking water, you are so, I think this is, uh, I heard from your podcast as well, like drinking water you will be so obsessed about drinking water. Like, when can I get water? So, like, yeah, it makes so much sense because the food or eating is kind of like one of the primary needs of our body. So Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, I think we covered a lot of it. Um, and definitely people can go to your blog and podcast and videos uh, and your book. So, maybe you can uh, share a little bit about your book. When is it coming out? Um... In the next couple of months, I think, um, it's, it's pretty much done. I've got another couple of people who are reviewing it at the moment and giving me feedback. But I think I'm pretty much done. Um, and uh, you know the process if you've written books as well. It's kind of like it's, it's a pretty long and, and difficult process. Um, yeah. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to be done. 
Um, and it's really most of it though, is just, it's, it's like everything. It's like just a consolidated, all the things that I put in my blogs and podcasts. Mm -hmm. It's like just draw, drawing it all together in one consolidated place. Um, but also, um, it is also like more of a, um, project management recovery guide, um, as well. So how to sort of set yourself up and troubleshoot and build you, whatever the support that you need around you, which might not be what the support people tell you that you have, but understanding that you know best about what you need. And so therefore you should be the one to say whether you need a dietitian or not, or whether you need a therapist or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that sort of thing. And, yeah. And uh, and on your website you have uh, like a free toolkit, or how? Yeah, is it I've called? taken that down. I've taken that down for the moment, just because I'm sort of mm. revising all of that, and mm -hmm. the book that I'm writing will replace that. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I had that on the website for a, a while, and um, from people's feedback of, of that as well, I, I've learned a lot. So yeah, okay. So thank you for sharing all that, and we will link all your information down below, like your YouTube and and blog and podcast and everything. Uh, so do you have any last words you want to share? Do I have any last words that I want to share? Don't be afraid of your hunger. It's there for a reason. It's trying to save your life. So just shut up and listen to it. <laughs> I think this is great. Thank you so much.